All right. Well, today I spent, you know, all all day going shopping for Nico because tomorrow's his second birthday. I was here last year for his first birthday, and you know that was obviously special because I missed his birth because I was in I was in prison for this pimping and pandering debacle. Um, you know, and I've been out for a little over a year, and I can honestly say that I'm a good dad, and you know, for all the scumbag shit that I've done throughout my life, because it, it's been, <laughs> the list is pretty alarming, the piece of shit things that I've done throughout my life, um, you know, but one thing that I've done well is be a good father, you know, I provide for him, I provide for my wife, um, you know, and even though we're going to be quarantined, I went and I bought him a bunch of decorations to make our house fun. I got a bunch of glow sticks so that, you know, we can celebrate in the day, but then we can turn off all the lights and we have all this different stuff that'll glow. I got him a bunch of good presents. And I'm just proud of the fact that I've stepped it up and I'm a good dad. When we get to the third part of uh, the third prison term, we'll get into, um, you know, everything that I went through basically to get back home to him. Um, and you know, it was a really, it was just a really fucked up period of my life. Um, you know, 12 riots in three months. Uh, that's when they started the integration mixing PC with GP, which how, how could anyone think that that's going to go? Okay. You know, um, and we're going to get to that. And the reason you know, some people have kind of complained that some of the stuff's derivative or repetitive, because I talk about some of it on the album, it's important. And once we get to the third term, you're going to know why. So much stuff that happens in this period is a crucial part of my third term. So let's get into it. Like, comment, subscribe, patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Um, I know that I'm going to be doing some, some stuff with Mickey Avalon soon and, uh, I'm excited. I got a bunch of surprise collaborations going, but, um, I'm really excited with the stuff that I'm going to be doing with him because I've been a fan for a long time and, uh, and now we're friends and I, I just, I, I like all the art he puts out. I like the music he puts out and I think he's really funny. So I'm excited to, uh, well, suck his dick already, Ryan. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, yeah. So. All right, let's get into the story. I don't practice these little warm-ups anymore. I just go straight into it. So if I'm a little rusty when I start, I apologize. Where we had stopped off last time, um, you know, I'd gone down to uh, I'd gone down to Skid Row, and Karina at this point, her alcoholism was the worst I'd seen it. Now I know that when we were together wasn't the worst that she'd been in her entire life because she'd been, she was, she's a real deal alcoholic. You know, you'll hear people be like, Whoa, bro, I was an alcoholic. I used to be hung over for like six, seven days straight. And then I'd have to go to work. No, she was like leaving Las Vegas, like wake up shaking. Like how I'd seen Paul years and years before he was like really the only legit alcoholic I'd ever met. And, you know, I've come to realize that alcoholism, especially with like AA philosophy, it's more something that's in your mind. You know, it's a flawed way of thinking. Um, that's just the way that they uh, interpret it. I mean, recovery is just like reality. It's subjective. So it's just how we personally interpret what recovery means to us, um, you know, because it's it's a personal thing. But I have come to realize that alcoholism is based on, you know, uh, a spiritual malady and an ego malady. Um, and I've borrowed some of that from AA, but some of it's stuff that I've determined for myself, flawed thinking. But there's also physically dependent alcoholics. So I don't know how to separate the terms. You know, I don't... We can just say that she was another like Paul that was actually physically dependent. And I had been physically dependent. So I'd met Paul then I'd been to rehabs throughout my life. And I'd always met people, you know, and I'd always see them like shivering and, you know, you know how it is at rehab. There's always rivalry, like the heroin addicts hang out, the heroin addicts, the tweakers hang out, with the tweakers, 
you guys all talk shit about each other. And you're like, hey, those, those tweakers, queer juice. <laughs> yeah, those guys fag off. <laughs> no, I'm cool. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I've only given a hand job for heroin. Yeah. Those guys, those guys just get high and do shit like that. I, I do it because I was sick. You hear heroin X say that. And then, you know, you'll see like the overweight alcoholic shivering, beads of sweat going down his face. And <laughs> that guy thinks he's sick. I, I'm fucking dope sick. I can't believe alcohol is what he has a headache or something. What a bitch. That's really how people talk in rehab. And, you know, I would be lying if I said that that wasn't how I used to think. I used to look at alcoholics and I'd be like, you know, you have no idea what I'm going through as a heroin addict, what physical dependency is like, because I'd been addicted. I was very addicted to cocaine when I was a teenager, when I was in high school. I mean, when I was 16, I was doing an eight ball of cocaine a day, which is like a lot. That's three and a half grams. That's a lot of coke. A lot of people just get that with their buddies on like a Friday night. And that's like their splurge. I was doing that. I was spending savings bonds and like my college savings that I would find, you know, uh, sporadically in my parents' room. And I found enough where I could sustain um, a cocaine. Well, I started selling it as well. I was doing an eight ball a day. I was a real coke addict. And then when I'd stop, yeah, there's psychological withdrawal. You have really bad anxiety, really bad depression. Same with when you come off meth, you know, you sleep for a week, but then you're just low and it's the lowest low. You also get that with heroin, but um, I feel like the, the, the mental stuff is the mental anguish for crystal meth or for cocaine is pretty severe. So I had always, you know, once I'd felt what kicking heroin felt like, which is pretty fucking bad. It's nothing like methadone. Methadone is the worst thing you can ever possibly go through. There's no worse pain you're going to endure as a drug addict uh, aside from coming off methadone. That is the worst physical pain you'll ever feel. Um, you know, it's if you've had cotton fever, it feels like that for six months. You know, in the first month of it's cotton fever times like a thousand. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. You know, um, a lot of people don't make it past it to even be able to talk about it. But you know, like I'd said, I'd see people kicking in rehab and I, I saw Paul. I knew that he was like, you know, he was like a different kind of alcoholic. Like he was, I don't want to say real deal, but he was physically dependent. That's probably the only way that I can like differentiate. And then I became physically dependent unbeknownst to me. And we had talked about that. I went out to Denver. I tried to kick and the whole bed started vibrating. I felt like I was at some fucking cheap lover motel or something. It was just like, brrr. I was like, what the fuck? I thought that I had like slipped a quarter into the bed or something without even knowing it. And, and then of course there was the time right before I got the DUI, well, the one that got thrown out where I drank Listerine and I drank cologne. That was another time that I literally, you know, had a seizure and I flopped out of bed and, uh, you know, and then there was the time that I kicked in bed and ate balloons covered in shit. So I knew, and, and that was delirium tremens. I mean, that was like, lid, sorry, I don't usually use this chair. Um, it was really uncomfortable. Um, you know, so I, um, I had experienced physical withdrawal from alcohol, delirium tremens, the hallucinatory thing. So I knew that it was, it was like a real thing and kicking alcohol is pretty bad. I mean, the time that I had to do it where I was chained to the bed, I was also kicking heroin. So it wasn't really like an accurate, um, it, it wasn't just like a pure, fuck am I doing that's like how like directors accept awards at the academy you know, when they're like at the academy awards they're just like sitting there like when they're trying to look all dignified and shit I'm talking about kicking alcohol when I'm kicking alcohol it was crazy brother cathartic um so I've never you know like I'd never really kicked it by itself but I knew that that time that I was chained to the bed it was pretty bad it was worse than just kicking heroin like by itself so I knew that it was it was the real deal and Karina besides Paul and myself was like the third person I'd met in my life that was like legitimately 
addicted to it, you know, like she had like a physical dependency to alcohol. She would get shakes and she would go through withdrawals if she didn't drink. And I watched her get worse and worse and worse. And when she drinks, she's a different person. She'll flirt with other guys to make me mad. I got in a fist fight one time outside of Costco because well you know what I'll save that but it was like just because she was literally trying to make me jealous with some guy and I was drunk and I just went up to him and I took off on him and uh I mean I'm I'm out on bail and I'm on federal probation the fuck was I thinking but she's one of those people when she drinks and there's a lot of women like that Uh, my ex-wife was like that too she would create she tried to make me jealous because I'm a jealous guy to begin with but like, you know, in my later years, I'd actually, when I was like 18, 19, my first few relationships, I was with girls that wouldn't do anything to make me jealous. And I was just like hyper jealous anyway. And then as I got older, I started being with girls that would make me jealous. The irony in that. Um, and, and I'd react very poorly to it, especially after I'd been to the feds for five years when I actually was, had turned into a pretty violent person. I thought that like to settle stuff, you would fight. And when she drank, she had the propensity to try to make me jealous. By the time we went to detox, she was drinking so badly that I was really concerned about her. You know, a couple times we'd be at motels and she'd break shit, shatter mirrors and just belligerently like rock star drunk drama stuff. And then the next day she'd have no idea that she did it. And it became clear to me that her alcoholism was getting dangerous. And then I became strung out on heroin and alcohol right around that time. So when we had gone to detox, a lot of it was just out of concern for her because she was just, she's getting so bad. You know, she was um, maybe like a couple days before we had actually gone down there the night that I went down to Skid Row, but a couple nights before that, before we had decided to go, I remember one of our worst days of drinking We had gone to Trader Joe's um, in Santa Barbara. We didn't have any money. And I like told Karina that she should steal a bottle of wild turkey. And, you know, she was already drunk. And she's like, okay. And she just put it, she had, you know, like some big coach purse or something. She always has like nice designer stuff. And she put the wild turkey in her purse. And we had already been drinking all morning. We go and drink like we went to a Burger King and we got like a cup and we just filled it with straight wild turkey, put a straw in it. And we're just passing this wild turkey back and forth and we keep it in our purse and then take it out when we wanted to refill the cup. And there was this homeless guy, this black dude, old black guy, missing teeth. Nobody I should be jealous about, but I went inside to take a piss. I come out and she's flirting with him or at least talking to him, maybe not flirting. I'm just drunk and, and, you know, embittered by the situation. And, you know, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, I'm doing what I want. I want to talk to this guy. This guy's cool. I'm like, you. I was like, what? And just spit in her face. And the black guy's like, oh, man, I don't even involved with this shit. And he just took off. And she's like, you're such a piece of shit. Fuck you. And she like hit me with the purse. So, I mean, we're like on a busy commercial strip in Santa Barbara. It's a street called Milpas. There's a lot of people around. It's probably like one in the afternoon. And it becomes this like cat and mouse thing where we'll start arguing. She'll be like, I'm fucking out of here. And she'd run down the street. Now, me, I have this weird like so many drug addicts, this like pathological codependency a girl takes off. I'll run after her, you know, I'll, and I'll, you see that a lot with like emotionally abusive, sick drug addicts. Like if you don't get healthy in the mind, a lot of people are like this. They're just in relationships like this. They're just be like, I want you to die. You stupid cunt. And you'll just say some really crazy shit piss them off to the, the girl off to the point where they'll leave and then you freak out because you don't want to be alone and you'll chase after them. And it's just, it goes on and on and on. It's this cycle like that. And eventually we, you know, like she'd go a couple blocks, I'd find her, you know, I'd like grab her, we'd start kissing and makeup. 
and let's go get a Big Mac at McDonald's, but we wouldn't have money, so I'd have to go like panhandle. I'd get us enough money to get a, a Big Mac, not the meal, just the burger, and get us each one. And, you know, we'd, we'd eat it and we'd drink, you know, in the McDonald's parking lot, and then we'd keep going down the street. And we had done that, and we were like going down kind of like, I don't know, not a bad street because there's not really any bad parts of Santa Barbara, but it's kind of like one of the more, you know, run down sections in Santa Barbara. And, you know, she's, we're not even arguing at the time. We're just walking and she falls. She does this all the time when she's super drunk. That's why they call her Hurricane uh, Katrina. And she's walking and she just falls off a curb falls right on her face bam and uh you know i'm like oh shit and i I was like are you okay and i go to grab her and she looks up and she's got blood on her face and she's like look at what you did to me and i was like i was like i didn't do that what do you mean you she we were not even arguing at that point but it had been like the kind of day you know it had been a combative day where we're arguing all day i spit on her earlier so i mean just emotions are are soaring anyway look at what you did to me it really reminded me of my ex-wife he's abusing me but the difference between my ex-wife and karina is karina actually fell oh again i didn't nothing i didn't touch her she's just walking she's wearing like uh, platforms she goes to step off a curb like we're walking on the sidewalk in this neighborhood and she just trips and hits her face and blood starts gushing down so she, not only is she saying like how about you did to me but she's bleeding now there's these south siders probably like 35 years old you know pretty much my age um i didn't know them though they might not even been South Siders. They're just Hispanic guys that could have been South Sider. South Sider esque. They had South Sider tendencies. And they're looking at me and they're all wearing, you know, like their flannel shirts and dicky shorts and shit. And I, I some of my wife beaters, they all have shaped heads. And she's like, Look at what you did to me, you piece of shit. And they're just like coming at me. It's like school of hispanic guys that just want to fuck me up and i'm just i I look at them and then i look at her and there's blood coming down her face and i'm just like oh no i'm out of here and i just take off i run down the street i run so fast i don't even know if they chase me i don't even really know what's going on i end up going to this homeless shelter um in Santa Barbara and I'm, you know, I, 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 there's a group of people standing outside. I'm like, Hey, can I use somebody's cell phone? And, you know, I mean, nowadays people that are homeless have, so they have Obama phones. Someone let me use their phone. I think I, I don't remember. I called one of my friends and they came and picked me up. And then, you know, I didn't hear from her for like, like a full day. I don't even know what happened that night. And, um, you know, at that point I was, like you know i was strung out on heroin so i mean i was preoccupied with that eventually when i saw her again um you know she was just she was in as bad a shape as she was when i first saw her so we had decided to go to the detox we got our parents to pay and when we get down to you know la we have to go to orange county la is before orange county and i tell her i need to stop to get heroin we went over this in the last video i take her to town street downtown LA right by Skid Row and I leave her locked in the car and she tells me that somebody licked the window you know I, I like leave her locked in the car in this BMW SUV go I score within like five minutes and I come back and she's she's literally like shivering because she's so scared she's like 108 pounds and she's just like oh my god some guy licked the window and I thought she I was like nobody licked the window and you could you could seriously see this snail trail of saliva like that it, it, it actually went down i was like jesus why would someone do that some creepy fucking people down there and that's just you know a testament to how much i didn't care about anyone but myself and my addiction you know i just i didn't care just i locked her in there i was like stay here go be fine what if she wasn't fine what if the crackhead that licked the window had like broken in and 
dragged her out by her hair and like raped her or something. And, you know, that may sound outlandish and, and, and not possible, but, you know, I would side with uh, somebody licking the window as fiction and it wasn't. That actually happened. So you think if someone went that far, um, it's not that unlikely that they'd push it a little further. So I get back in the car and, you know, again, it was like the time that we did the acid and she had the bad trip. And she's like, why would you take me to this place? And I remember feeling so bad for her because I did love her and I did care for her. Um, and that's how addiction works. Like you can do f scumbag stuff to somebody in in a moment because drug addiction is just, I think, a series of impulsive bad decisions a lot of them you know not one or two thousands you know that thousands of impulsive bad decisions that make up a collective body which i guess we call run that's a universal term when you're on your run the window of time that you're actively in addiction or alcoholism is your run and that's what it that's what it is it's just a series of bad impulsive decisions and you make them in the moment and it's not like it's not like I did that because I didn't care about her. I did it because when you're addicted to heroin, when you're addicted to any drug, you put that before anybody. You put that before your own well-being. You know, like the time that I got busted by the feds and I went down there, got arrested, and then go down there the next day, I was like, Phew. yeah, I got arrested in some really sketchy sting. I'll probably get I'll probably get away with it the second time. It's whatever. Get arrested again. They were shocked. They're like, "What the fuck? You're down here again? Are you are you are you an idiot?" And actually, me getting arrested twice actually helped me because it convinced the court that I was fucking insane. My attorney's like, "Look, look, look. My client is 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 not an idiot. It may look it may look that way. It may look that way on paper." Because he got arrested like a couple days in a row. But think about it. Think about it. He must be really addicted if he did something that stupid. Now, of course, he said it in more like eloquent, you know, um, lawyer verbiage than that. But that's basically what the, that's what the subtext was, you know, that, you know, there must be something wrong with it. That it's it's a uh, it's a testament to my addiction, showing just how severe it was. I knew that obviously something was wrong if I just got set up in a huge sting operation like that, and then I go down and get arrested again in a similar sting operation with the same fucking drug dealer, like you know, um, and that's insanity. And I, I, you know, and then they did a psychological evaluation. They determined that I was bipolar, ADD. Impulsivity is, you know, one of the major um, issues with that. It's one of the major, um, you know, commonalities with ADD and bipolar. But I think it it's, speaks to addiction at large. I think we all have impulsivity issues. And, you know, it's, so that's why, you know, that's why so many women have left me and the reason's always been heroin. Like if you did an exit survey of women that have dated me, they'd be like super small cock, reasonably bomb personality, gives good head, kind of makes up for the small dick. But ultimately, and you know, most women I've been with, can live with the jealousy even though that's got to be annoying and i'm not like that with her i don't you know we have separate lives it's whatever i trust her she wrote a term out with me and i think that really helped our relationship a lot but um you know most women will say that they left me or that the relationship didn't work out because they can't compete with heroin because i'm more in love with heroin than i am with the woman which is absolutely true um, and then, you know, you get asexual when you're on heroin, you don't want to fuck. So you you smell, you don't have sex and you like sticking needles in yourself better than sticking your dick inside of their butt. 
and like all of those things combined in concert generally a, a turn off for most women of any reasonable um class so she's crying and she's upset and she you know it's it's understandable we go to orange county and i remember going in like i don't know it's like a pharmacy you know one of the ones where you know you had to like ask the staff for the code hey uh can i have the code i'll, I'll buy i'll buy something i'll buy a snickers oh yeah yeah here it is and they give it to you and then you're in there for like 45 minutes you come out there's like blood all over you yeah that's me and i shot heroin and that was like the last time that i did it um you know, it's like my last hurrah before detox. So we, we end up, and she's still mad, but one thing that is good for, one thing good about both of us is that we, you know, we, we forgive and forget very quickly. So we end up going to this detox and she's drinking the whole time. She was drinking while I was driving. I'm drinking while I'm driving as well. And I'm on heroin too. Well, I mean, I was on it the whole time, but I got extra high because I was going into detox. We go into the intake process and the guys, this is like a very um, piece of shit place. Super unprofessional. Um, I'd been kicked out of there the last time I was there because basically I called them out on the fact that the staff was fucking the patients, <laughs> you know, like all the guys that work there were like my age, like sketchy drug addicts that had like, 45 days sober and now they're like i'm gonna lead this group all right let's process our feelings it's like they're still feeling post-acute withdrawal but they're gonna tell me how, how to get sober um and then they would have sex with the girls you know and even the lady that ran it was like 40 but she was like botox just some gross older lady that thought she was still 20 and she was still a straight legendary slut you know she never slowed down and she was fucking the guys there too so it's just this really like debaucherous place and we went to go do our intake and they're asking us our drug history because they're gonna um you know they're gonna induce the suboxone the next day and they're asking us different stuff you know for me they're asking her about her um alcohol history and while we're doing the intake she's like completely drunk and she's like staring at one of the guys. Now the guy is like not good looking, someone I generally would not be jealous of at all, but she's just looking at him. She's just like, I'm sorry, I'm distracted right now. And it just pfft, makes me, I'm already on heroin. So I'm already an angry guy when I'm loaded and I just freak out. I, li I literally slapped the um, clipboard out of this guy's hand. And I was like, all right, we're done. And just slap it. And I was like, I'm going to leave here right now unless me and her can room together. They're like, look, we're not, you're, you're at a detox facility. You guys can't room up. You've been here before. You can't room up with her. I'm like, this guy's flirting with my girlfriend. He's like, flirting with your girl? He's like, bro, I'm just asking her the, the drug, the intake questions. How am I flirting? And she's just like biting. She's like, Ugh. like she's just trying to make me mad what she would do when she was drunk and uh i don't even remember what happened that night i think i just like stormed out of there and like went passed out in the room next day um we're both not all fucking drunk that's for sure we're not feeling well and they give us the typical cocktail the librium and they give me the little two milligrams of subutex or suboxone whatever it is they give you small milligram they give you these little bullshit things where you still definitely feel sick they gradually you know transition you from heroin onto the suboxone and it's crazy how in detox you never go into precipitated withdrawal or at least i never have but on the street it happens to me all the time and in case you guys don't know what that is real quick precipitated withdrawal is if you take Suboxone or Subutex or anything with Naloxone um, or any of these buprenorphine, um, you know, opiate antagonist drugs. Methadone won't do this, but buprenorphine will and Naloxone will do it. When you take it, so you can take, you can do heroin or an opiate if you're already on buprenorphine, which is in Subutex and Suboxone. You can be on Subutex or Suboxone and do heroin or do a painkiller and you're not going to get sick. 
you're not going to feel it all the way. We talked about this last time. Get a little itchy, get a little grouchy. Maybe you can't come, even though you're not getting the euphoric rush. But when it's the opposite and you're on heroin and you take a subutex or suboxone, you'll go into precipitated withdrawal, which is like you instantly go into withdrawal. And it's not just regular withdrawal. It's like amplified. It's like the the fucking, you know, it's it's the the Coachella of withdrawal. It's not just like a, a one band thing. It's like 20 of your favorite bands like screaming at once, but not in a good way. It's just screaming withdrawal. The analogies that I'm falling off with analogies. I used to do good ones. At, what the fuck? It's the, co- it's the Coachella of withdrawals. Like I said that with the, do you guys notice that I said that with a straight face? It's really horrible. And you have to wait. They say it's 24 hours or 48 hours. I never wait. I can never wait. I'm like, you know, they're like, okay, if you feel sick, you can take it. And I'm always like, and I'm just a bitch. I'm a bitch. I'm the biggest bitch when it comes to what I'm so sick. And like, I won't be sick. You know, you can also tell by your pupils. Your pupils are still spin or your pupils are still pinned. You're not sick. When your pupils start getting dilated you know that you're legitimately sick. So my pupils will be pinned and I'm like, I'm sick. And someone will give me something. It's just, I've learned to be like that. Just, you know, bitching sometimes give, gets people to give you drugs. But I always took the Suboxone or the Subutex, um, you know, too soon. A detox seems like they have it down to a sense. They have a stop. Oh, all right. It's been 20 hours. Here you go never go into precipitated withdrawal. So the next morning we do, we do all that. We get on our medications and she's not being flirtatious with anyone. She's just, how is she normally? I mean, when she's off alcohol, she's a completely different person. She's being sweet. You know, she's like being affectionate with me, smoking a cigarette. She's sitting on my lap. Then they find her sitting on my lap. They get mad. And, um, you know, she's my girlfriend again my friend again you know she's not psycho drunk slut like she was seven eight hours before that now during the detox process they do have meetings they have aa and all that but you don't have to do that you can kind of just lounge at this it's a house a residential house you can just lounge and like watch movies and then like once the detox phase is over then you start doing all the meetings and stuff and it's co-ed so i mean you're not allowed to like have physical contact with the opposite sex but um and they call it for fraternizing oh stop fraternizing which sounds it sounds weird i mean that's something they say at rehab but you, you don't i mean you know it's not like the kind of shit you say when you're like going clubbing with your friends like man tonight we're either gonna start a fight or i'm gonna fraternize some bitch homeboy Let's do it. Nobody talks like that. But that's a term they use in rehab. So, you know, we're in this living room and we can watch a movie. And so we decide to uh we decide to watch Shawshank Redemption. I always like that movie. I always cry at the end when uh when he gets out and then they meet at the beach, Morgan Freeman and Andy Dufresne. And we're watching it, we have a blanket over us. And I don't know why, but I feel like getting jerked off. Hey, shh. So I tell Karina, I'm like, hey, jerk me off. She's like, what? I was like, yeah, do it under the blanket. I don't know. Jerk me off. What the fuck? You're my girlfriend. Shoot it. And she's like, okay. No, she didn't. When she's sober, she doesn't talk to me. She's like, okay. So she like, I'm wearing like sweatpants and she puts her arm and you know i've gotten jerked off in this very place the last time i was there i think i was just like i don't know i was like yeah, i'm gonna keep the tradition going you get jerked off right here in the same couch with this probably the same blanket that blanket has probably covered thousands of dudes getting jerked off by chicks or tweakers whatever so She's doing it. And of course, you can see it. You can't hide that unless there's the technique that I've taught you in prison where you do like the opposite stroke. You can't really hide a hand job. Fucking, it looks kind of crazy. You know, the blank is just rattling. And then, you know, 
I'm just kind of like making the the face, you know, the jerk off face, like biting like one corner of my lip. Staff, sketchy, like tattooed Orange County, like bro kind of guy, you know, the bros. We're like Ed Hardy. Hey, fool, check out my new Ed Hardy shirt. Yeah, is that glitter? It's glitter. So what? Sick, huh? Yeah, dude. Check out this new motocross video fire so those kind of guys when he walks by and he's just like whoa what are you guys doing i'm like what do you think we're i don't it's my girlfriend who gives a fuck what we're doing dude we're watching shawshank redemption he's like no no uh-uh. that blanket was moving and i said and his name is brandon i said what exactly are you trying to say, Brandon? He's like, I'm saying that you just got jerked off under that blanket by your girlfriend. You're, you're disgusting, Leone. You're disgusting. Go to the office. I had 30 fucking, t- I'm 31 years old, walking to the office where I have to like lie to the, you know, the person that was running this rehab about me not getting jerked off by my own girlfriend. We're voluntarily going there. It just feels ridiculous. And they basically give me a warning. And they say now that that happened, that we basically got caught. I um, forget what they said. No, that, that was a hand fraternization. It's, it's not chill. Not chill here. Since we got that, they said that we couldn't talk to each other anymore. And I was like, we can't talk? Fuck that. I'm cool. If I can't talk to my girlfriend. I'm gone. And they're like... They're like, well, if you leave, we're not going to let you back. I was like, is that a threat? I don't want to be here. I came here to get better with her, not to be cut off from her. I Like, if you don't want me to get jerked off by her in the common area while we're watching Shawshank Redemption, that's fine. But don't cut me off from talking to her. This is a very important time for us to rebuild our relationship. Well, we got kicked out right there and then. They were not. They weren't with it, you know? And, uh, I mean, I was, like, problematic the first time. And now there was that. So I had my mom's car. And I forget what we told my parents and her dad. But we did. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had her dad cancel the check. And I had my parents cancel the check. And I just said we got kicked out. That's what happened. I said we had gotten kicked out. So we actually, they actually didn't have to pay for any of that. So we made it, like, I want to say just that one day. Yeah, we were, no, two days. So that all happened over like a 48 hour period. It was long enough where when we got out of it, just a couple days away from heroin, I was able to get back on Suboxone because I already had them from before I was prescribed to them. So I had them in my car. And so that's the one good thing that came out of it is like the, just two days away from heroin, I was able to get back on to my Suboxone uh, prescription which I already had. I just started taking them again. I was slamming them, actually. I slammed them the whole time from when I got out from my second time in federal prison to when I went to go do my third term. So we end up going back to Santa Barbara. I have to give my mom her car back. And we kind of just go back to doing the same stuff. Um, At that point, I quit my job. For some reason, I stopped working there. Maybe, yeah, I think I just quit because I didn't want to go back to doing heroin. Yeah, no, this is what happened. Okay, now I remember. So we get back and I do go back to that job. And I get a call from my PO, Josh. And he tells me that I need to get drug tested. I'm like, okay. Okay. And, you know, I was, I had been on color code. Now I was off color code again. So when you're off color code in the feds, about once a month, they call you in and you have to go to the office. Now, because the office is in Ventura and I was living in Santa Barbara, they would actually call and tell you ahead of time when you needed to test. So you'd have some, um, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have an advance notice. Maybe it was only a day ahead, but you'd at least have time to prepare if you were dirty. And so I told Karina, like, 
you know, yeah, I was at work and I called her and I was just like, Hey, um, my PO called and I have to get drug tested. And she's like, Oh my God, are you still dirty? Like, yeah. I mean, this was like three or four days later. So there was a, a really good chance that I was still dirty. So she's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I got it. Got it a hundred percent. So we end up going to the hospital when I get off work and I just start complaining about having a kidney stone, you know, and I'd learned that in a William S. Burroughs book. He's talking about like, if you go to a hospital and you're like a good, I'm a decent enough actor because I've had to be throughout the years of doing heroin. It just comes with being a dope fiend. If you're a dope fiend, especially if you've been to prison, you got to play parts. You do. And you just get better at it. And, you know, I just went into the hospital and I think I used the fact that if I didn't make them believe me that I was in a lot of pain, that I was definitely going to go back to prison. And I was already out on bail for catching the pimping case. If I got a dirty for heroin at this juncture, that's it. I was going away. So I go to the hospital, I go to the waiting room and I'm telling, you know, the lady, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. There's so, it feels like I'm peeing fiberglass. And she's like, sir. Yeah. She said this for real. She's like, have you had any? I was like, I was like anal sex. And like people in the waiting room could hear me say that. It was super um, embarrassing. I think she thought that I had caught some sort of bacterial infection from anal sex. I guess I just looked like the type, you know? I bet like when I walked in, like she was talking to like her nurse friends and they're like, damn, that fool the anal for sure. But I was like, no, it's not that. It just every time I pee, I think, I think I'm passing some sort of stone and I kind of fold over in pain. And she's like, sir, you let it, let me take your um, let me take your uh, your blood pressure, and I just run, you know, because she wants to take my vital. I run to the bathroom. I do a bunch of push-ups. Now I'm in reasonably good shape. I probably did like 60, 70 in a row, just like quick, like pumped them out. And uh, you know, I came back and I put I put a little water all over like this part of my shirt, got my face so I looked a little you know clammy. And I was like, uh, I just. I just vomited because I'm in so much pain. And she's like, we got to take your vitals. So she takes my vitals and my blood pressure is way, way out of whack. And that's a trick that I had learned, you know, in, in jail or in rehabs when I, went, when I was bored and I wanted to get shot up with Thorazine, you know, if your blood pressure was off and you acted like you're having some sort of manic fit, they'll shoot you up with Thorazine, which isn't even that, like, not like pleasurable. It's literally something we would just do if we were bored like huh, this sucks anything on tv no nope. mm, let's try to get shot up with thorzine all right let's see who can do more push-ups we do it and then we get shot up with thorzine so my blood pressure was out of whack and the purpose of that at a hospital is when they take your vitals and your vitals are off at all whether it be your pulse rate or your blood pressure you get priority so it expedites um you know, you seeing the doctor. Vitals are off. And when I finally see the doctor at this point, I'm invoking all the emotion from everything that's going on, going back to prison, um, the anger that I have at Karina because she'll get wasted and try to make me mad uh, that she was talking to her ex, um, you know, that my parents were both in pretty bad health at that moment. My mom was getting the onset of Alzheimer's and my dad had uh, arrhythmic heart stuff. And both of them, you know, it, it, both of them were getting older. They were getting more complications. And I just thought of all these things, just this confluence of shit that would make me emotional. And I just start crying. You know, just like, oh, I'm in so much pain. And he's asking me questions. I know all the right stuff to ask. Have I ever had a stone before? Yes. Uh, telling him what medications I've been on. Please give me something for my pain. Do you have a history of drug addiction? Of course not. I've smoked weed. Does that, does that count? You've never done a, an opiate or opioid? I don't even know what that is. I just, yeah. So he ends up giving me Dilaudid, a shot of Dilaudid. It's all I needed. 
Right. I get the shot at a lot. He gives me some other shit. I forget what it was. He didn't give me a prescription, though, for Pangolin. But he gave me a, sh- a shot at Dilaudid. And Dilaudid is uh, synthetic morphine. So it will come up as an opiate. Oh, in the heat, I also got a, um, a Percocet. Yeah, that's right. I got, like, one Percocet that was in this, like, single-serving, like, little uh, bubble wrap thing. Or, I don't know. It's weird. It was, like, one Percocet that they had to give you there. You know, to take it in front of them. So I got Dilaudid and I got a Percocet while I was there. And I end up leaving, you know, discharge and, you know, just act like I'm going to go get the other medications that he's giving me, pharmacy. Now, the only reason I did that was because, you know, if I was dirty, not saying that I, I was, it was right on the line. It was like, I did heroin a few days before, but it may or may not still be in my system. What I was more worried about was detox drugs being in my system, Librium, which would come up as a benzo. You know, I was worried about that kind of stuff. Cause how am I going to explain that? I didn't tell my PO that, yeah, hey man, um, I'm going to detox for heroin and alcohol. I don't know, I'm cool, I'm chill, I'll be back. Yeah, right, he would have violated me right there and then. So I go in, I mean, I pee for him. Now you don't get results there and then which is always nerve wracking because once you give them the piss, if you're dirty, you're dirty. And they'll ask you if it comes up dirty, because then they'll send it to a lab. And I don't know if I'd ever talked about this, but at one point, you know, I think this is when I was living, it may have been this period or may have been when I was living in uh, North Hollywood when I was married. But at one point I called Washington DC and was asking I, I presented myself as a journalist that I had worked that I worked for Vice and that I was doing um a, a a favorable article about drug testing and how drug testing helps manage crime. I presented it like I was like sympathetic to locking nonviolent drug offenders up. Oh yeah, those pieces of shit lock those fools up. They deserve it. And, um, you know, I talked to them for a little bit and somehow I had made it from making that phone call. And I was just saying that to try to get intel about how the drug testing process worked. Because at that point I was like a committed junkie. I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to pretend like I'm some journalist. I'll take a bunch of notes and try to figure out how their testing system will count me. Uh, you know, what kind of tests they do, um, you know, what what would create a false positive, how accurate they are, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, I, I got some phone number to a lab in San Diego. So I, re- I figured out that all federal drug tests get sent to the same lab in San Diego. So I end up calling this lab. I get that from calling the number in DC. And I talk to this lab and I tell them the same shit that I'm doing some report for Vice. um, And let me just say this, sir. Um, Those uh, those of us at Vice feel very strongly that what you're doing, I'm just going to go ahead and say humanitarian work. Yeah, it's that important, man. Let me ask you a little bit about your process. So I start talking to them about it. I'm like, now, is that a six panel or is that an eight panel? And they're just telling me all sorts of crazy shit. And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, so how are you able to tell if it's a false positive or not? He goes, well, it's actually very expensive. Let's just say most people on any form of pretrial or supervision will just admit once the initial positive comes up. And that was a very important thing to learn about the whole process of federal drug testing. I was like, wait, so they're pretty much bluffing. If you challenge it and you deny it, now I'm not saying this works every time, but he said they do this quite a bit. If you challenge it, like they're like, hey, um, you came up dirty for cocaine. Did you do this or not? If you say you didn't, that can be held against you. That can be like another chart, like lying to a federal agent or whatever. But if you say no, if you say yes, that, that you did do it, it's an automatic violation not saying you go to prison for it 
but it's an admission of guilt. Every t- anytime you admit, if you just say that you did it, it cements it as that's what you did. If you deny it, there's a chance because of how much it costs that they actually won't send it to the lab. And they'll, you know, they'll pretend like they did. You just never hear about it again. That's how they do it. Like, okay, well, we're going to send this to the lab. You never hear about it again. I asked them about ETG, you know, uh, how, to, how, to text, te- how to test for the metabolites for alcohol. Because I was drinking heavily. It's like, yeah, we don't do that. A little secret here. Like, okay, well, thanks, Bob. I'll, I'll, I'll email you when, uh, when I come up with the first draft of the, of the article. Thanks a lot, buddy. And so I kind of knew how, how things worked. And, and that's how I started getting things off. So I went, I knew that when I peed for my PO, that he was going to be sending it to this lab in San Diego. And I was going to know really quick if it came up positive or not. It wouldn't matter. Because then I could be like, oh, I forgot to tell you. I'd gone to the hospital. They gave me Dilaudid. They gave me Percocet. So that's why I came up for opiates. Oh, and that's, that's why I came up for benzos as well. You know, whatever. I, I just figured that the whole hospital thing would kind of be like insurance. So I go and I take a piss. And, uh, you know, I just kind of give it to him confidently. Like, there you go. Write my initials on it. He's like, thanks. You know, it's always kind of weird, you know, when you go in there with the PO and you have to drop your pants or at least, I mean, you have to take your dick out. Now what I always do, which is a classic move. And I suggest that, you know, if you're on probation or parole, I'm not telling you to do this, but it's, so I've always found humor in it. Um, you know, when you go into the P into the bathroom with your probation officer, they have these mirrors so that like, they can look at like all angles to see if you have a wizenator, see if you have like a little, you know, two with fake piss. And, you know, usually guys will just like take their dick out of their zipper and pee in front of them. What I do is like what, you know, five-year-old kids do. I'll just take, I'll yank my pants and my boxers down all the way to my shoes. I do that at friends' houses anyway, but you should see the PO's face when you do that. Like they really look at you like you're the biggest weirdo ever. I mean, they never see that. You usually have the guy just yank it out. I just take my pants and boxers down. I just stand there, you know, with like, like holding my little dick like this, just to, just to fuck with him, you know? Um, so then like another few days goes by after I, I do the test and I'm at a park one morning. So now we have like this routine where Karina's parents go to work. Sometimes I sleep in her friend's car. Sometimes we're squatting in abandoned houses. We had found one abandoned house that was in our neighborhood. And we didn't even find that through like a open house with the realtor. We just found a house that was being worked on and we started staying there for a little bit. And then her parents would go to work. We'd go over there. Um, her dad always had a lot of like Bud Light stocks in the refrigerator. He also had hard liquor and we'd drink, we'd have sex, we'd shower. But one morning we're drinking beer at the park, waiting for her parents to go to work. And I had already broken, you know, her cell phone at this point. Second time, I, you know, get, um, I get another message on my phone from her boyfriend's new girlfriend, her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. And she goes, she's at it again, sending him emails this time. Now, I broke her phone, but she still had a computer at her parents' house. So I guess now she's sending this dude emails. And I fly into a rage, you know, I'm drinking a beer and, you know, I'm like, I go, I'm like looking on my phone. I see it again. I act calm, go to sip the beer. And instead of sipping it, I just like put it up to her and just pour it on her head. And this is at a part, like this is at a public place. There's like, you know, it's like people walking their dogs and they just see me pouring beer on this 30 two-year-old girl's face at like 7 30 in the morning it probably looked really weird we get in this huge fight and she ends up running back to her parents house she's so mad that i poured the beer on her and i'm like you're mad about that i'm mad that you did this shit to me so that night she disappears you know and usually we get in a fight for a few hours and then we make up and and whatever this night I didn't hear from her again. 
And I was like, you know, and <clears throat> I ended up getting a bunch of four locos and I got really drunk. I ended up calling my dad and he came and picked me up. Even though I was kicked out of the house, I was so drunk when I called him, he could hear how drunk I was. And I was like, dad, I'm so fucking wasted. Please come get me. And he came and got me. And he, he told me, he said, that was one of the only times he ever seen me drunk in my entire life. Took me back to his place. I passed out. And next morning I wake up thinking that, you know, by then Karina would have reached out to me. Nothing. And I'm like, what the fuck? And, you know, I go on Facebook Messenger because, you know, you can see when someone was last active. She hadn't been active for like 15 hours or something. I started getting really concerned. I wasn't thinking she was cheating on me. Well, I, probably that was my first thought. But even, even if she was doing that, I know her. She would have still reached out to me and be like, I'm fucking somebody. And I would have just been like, I would not have been cool with it. I was about to pretend like, oh, okay, that's cool. Well, call me when you're done, hon. No, I would have, I would have gone ballistic. But, um, you know, I'm like, damn, maybe she got drunk and passed out. So I kind of go back, you know, I finally like drift back to sleep because I'm super hungover. I wake up at like one in the afternoon. Had a nerd from her. I was like, wow. Call her parents' house because they had a landline. And after I'd broken her cell phone, that was like how I would call her if I had to. And I would just keep ringing and ringing and ringing. So now I'm starting to get really concerned. The last time I saw her is when I poured beer on her. Hadn't seen her since. I was thinking maybe she got abducted, you know? Maybe there's tons of weirdos out there. I started getting really concerned for her safety. Now, she told me that she was going to the Verizon store that day. So I literally called the Verizon store and, like, described what she looked like. And I was like, have you seen a Mexican girl? Pretty Mexican girl. Probably like She probably looks like she's 23 um you know nice ass beautiful smile guys like nothing like that today just a bunch of hogs huh boy but yeah i mean the guy was like why what's going on i was like i don't know man i think she might have gotten raped on some sort of camping trail he's like are you oh my god give me your phone number if i see anything i will call you so i like had the verizon guy billy at verizon i had that guy on the team start calling the jails i start calling the hospitals i'm getting really concerned at this point you know i'm mad but like at the same time i'm like getting increasingly more worried hours go by it's probably like seven o'clock at night it's, it's you know the next night now i finally get a call from her and she is wasted She's called me from her parents' house. And she's like, hey, where are you, faggot? She talks like Mirtha from Blow, um, if you've seen Blow. Uh, you know, the, the woman that Penelope Cruz plays, which is weird because I'm friends with the real Mirtha in, in real life. Nothing like how Penelope Cruz plays her. She, Penelope Cruz acts like she doesn't speak like English is in her first language. Mirtha isn't even Colombian. She's Puerto Rican. And English is her first language. She doesn't even have a fucking accent. But if you know the character the Penelope Cruz played in Blow, um, that's how that's how she kind of gets, even though she doesn't have an accent. You know, uh, what did you faggot, George? You don't fuck me anymore. You'll think you fucking gay. That's how she gets, but she doesn't know how to What are you, gay? You know, it's texting me. And you, and what have you been doing, you fucking loser? Like, she gets really um, not very pleasant when she drinks. And, uh, you know, I'm like, where are you? You know how worried I've been about you? I've been calling jail. And she's like, you're a pussy. I've been with Kendra all day. It's like, really? And he's like, yes. I went out to breakfast with her and this other guy now the guy that she had gone out to breakfast with was like some older guy she pretty much 
only hung out with because he had money. He was always trying to get with her. She never did. I firmly believe that because her best friend would tell me. She would put her on blast. You know, she'd always be like, no, he's tried. She always escapes the nick of time. But, you know, he'd buy her tattoos, buy her all sorts. Of, she's a, He's some creepy lame. She's basically hustling out of money when she was an alcoholic. And I hated this guy. Like, he would leave the creepiest text messages. Like, I love giving you a ride to work. The car reeks of your perfume. Sometimes I rub the scent on my Fruit of the Loom whitey tidies so that it can smell like we fucked each other. Like, he'd say weird, like, low-key, like, sex offender poetry or something. You know, it's like, what the fuck? Who says shit like that? And I get mad. I would like for I'm like ban. I'm like, dude, this guy like, you know, like he'd say. And th- to her credit, one time we got in this huge fight. And oh, I'll get to it in a second. But um, you know, she's like, you know, uh, he bought her like concert tickets one time for him to go with her. And uh, you know, it's like, well, if you have nothing going on with with that dude. Tell him that you want to take me instead and see if he'll give you the tickets. And he ended up giving her the tickets. Um, you know, so he, she was always trying to make it seem like there wasn't anything there and that that was just a sense of humor. But she said that he was with, she was with that guy and with her best friend, Kendra. So I called the salon that Kendra worked at, the one that, um, that Karina used to work at, where I fucked her in her boss, Walter's um, swivel chair. And I asked if Kendra was there. She was there. You know, Karina told me it was her day off. This is after I'd gotten off the phone with Karina. So I called the salon back and I say, hey, um, or I called Karina back and I'm like, hey, I just called the salon. You're full of shit. Kendra's been there all day. It's not her day off. She's like, I was with the dude that I would get mad about. And I was like, wait, what? You were just with him by yourself? And she's like, yeah, who gives a shit? I was like, what the fuck? You've been missing for like God knows how long and you've been with this other fucking dude who we know wants to have sex with you. He's always trying to fuck you. At one point, you know, I had looked through her her old phone because she deleted a text thread with this guy, which is always a red flag. And what he had said is like, you're so hot, you know? And she deleted it because she wouldn't want me to see it. And, you know... I know she never did anything with this guy. Um, And like, she's sober and honest to a fault now. She'll tell me disgusting shit about her past. And I'm just like, yeah. (laughs) Oh yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I'll like one up it. And she'll be like, Oh my God, I was a slut. But like, Whoa. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That was like two years ago. And she's like, Oh my God, that's so weird. Anyway. Um, so, you know, I was looking through her phone to, you know, because I was like, let me see what he actually says. Cause she had deleted the text thread to her credit. At one point, this piece of shit, he's like 60 years old or how he's like 50. So I don't know. He's old, old balls. You know, he had messaged her and uh, been like, you know what? I drive you to work every day. You know, I'm always buying you stuff. I bought you a tattoo. You could at least throw me a bone. Like, pretty much saying, like, hey, <laughs> I'm doing favors for you. Don't even trip that I'm, like, in my late 50s and you're in your early 30s. Um, you could suck my dick once in a while. What about that? And she went off on him. And she's like, it'll never be like that. You're fucking gross. I don't look at you that way. We're just friends. I just use you for money. <laughs> you know, because when she's drunk, she's just she keeps it one hundo. So to her credit, I knew that she hadn't done anything with him. But when, you know, I found out that she had been with this guy all day, I broke up with her, you know, Um, because I may be codependent, but I'm not a sucker, you know, and I'm not going to tolerate shit like that. Like, you're not going to go hang out with some other dude all day and then just say, okay, I'm sorry. And I know why she hung out with the guy because he took her out to breakfast. 
and then she, she he bought her you know bottles of liquor and he'd always try to get her wasted and she'd like barely escape and uh you know unfortunately girls like that um bad things happen to you know girls that are alcoholic often fall victim to predators it's just it it is what it is and this guy to this day i firmly believe that he's a predator um you know not just some like horny older guy that you know has a lot of money that wants to buy her stuff and when you're a sick alcoholic you're like okay you can buy me stuff um but i know you know i know this dude just had like really like gross intentions with her so i broke up with her and i said you know what i'm cool i'm not a sucker and she's like no so she had the same reaction that i was talking about earlier where you know it's like you'll do all this crazy stuff you'll sell this bad shit to your partner but then when they then when they're like i'm done bye then she got all crazy but i wasn't just bluffing i changed my relationship status on facebook and i even did a you know it was a few days before my birthday and I even did a, a post that said, breakup suck before your birthday. I don't want to spend my birthday alone. And that's usually just like a fishing thing. Like, hey, I'm single. Now who wants to have sex? Oh, okay. Hey, what's up? I'm Ryan. I'm a Leo. Now, right after I broke up with her, I get a phone call from my PO telling me that I'd come up dirty for opiates. And I was like, well... This is the thing, Josh. I had kidney stones, and uh, they gave me a shot of Dilaudid. They gave me a Percocet. And then he said, well, that doesn't matter because you have a warrant by the U.S. Marshals, and they're looking for you right now. So where are you? Because we know you're not living at your parents' house. And we will get into what's going to happen next in the next episode of the Pimping and pandering chronicles because i'm just such a good guy um tomorrow's nico's birthday my son and uh, i'm taking the day off so you guys will not see me i'm talking to patreon people right now but um anyway for all the um by the time you guys are watching this it's nico's birthday i'm just going to turn my phone off because he deserves my attention um maybe i'll do like a little live stream when it were like singing him happy birthday or something i don't know because i think i want to include some of like our family that might be the easiest way to do it maybe just include everyone but i appreciate you guys please like comment subscribe if you haven't checked out patreon there's pictures of my dick up there patreon.com slash ryan leone and yeah stay safe 